Last time we started doing homology by talking about a special type of, of cell complex. Delta complex. <clears throat> right, so these are built from simplices. So remember the n simplex is just a convex hull of m plus one uh, points in some Euclidean space in generic position. The standard simplex. is uh, just all of the points in Rn plus 1 uh, so that the coordinates add up to 1 and they're all non-negative. Right? And we denote this just delta upper n. <clears throat> we talk about oriented simplices by just listing, putting an order on the vertices, right? And we saw that uh, a face, which is what you get when you remove one vertex and then look at the convex hull of the, the remaining ones, uh, inherits a, an orientation from the one on the total space. Right? So with this in mind, we define a delta complex or a delta complex structure on a space X to be a collection of maps satisfying, on the one hand, if you restrict to the interior, this is a one-to-one -one map and you get all of x from the images of the interior. Right, and by disjoint union, uh, I want to, to um, emphasize that every point in x is in the image of a unique one of these when you've restricted to the interior. If f is a face of delta n, then the restriction of any one of these maps to that face is one of the other maps in your collection after you identify the face with the standard n minus 1 simplex via an orientation preserving affine map. And finally, we want the topologies to be the same. So we say that we want the open sets in X to correspond precisely to the inverse images of open sets. Uh, for every alpha, to be the ones to pull back to open sets along all of these maps. All right, and so that guarantees that we can reconstruct X from the delta complex structure um, together with its topology. Okay. Perfect. So given a, a delta complex structure on a set, we defined uh, some abelian groups, just a free abelian group with generators uh, given by all of the sigma alpha from delta n to x, all of the sigma alphas in the delta complex structure. And we defined boundary maps by asking that you restrict sigma to each of the faces Then you take the linear combination where you just add a sign that alternates depending on what face you're looking at. 
Okay? And this was the point of restricting uh, from cell complexes to delta complex structures. So then we have this nice algebraic description of what the boundary map should be. Right. Yes? So is delta lower than like x called the delta complex structure on x? Uh, no, the delta complex structure is the collection of maps. It's all of these maps. Right? This is uh, the chain complex corresponding to the delta complex structure. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, so, of course, since we're starting a new topic, it's going to be a ton of definitions. Um, so we saw that, um, so indeed, I just said uh, chain complex, so this is a chain complex. Well, I'll get to that in a moment. Let me just um, say here that um, we define the uh, homology groups corresponding to the C de to the uh, delta complex structure on X to be what you get from the kernel of delta n after you mod out by the image of delta n plus one, right? And so implicit there is the fact that the image of delta n plus one is a subgroup, a normal subgroup of the kernel, right? It's automatically normal because we're working with abelian groups, and um, and so now let me point out that this is an example of a more general thing that we like, which is called a chain complex. And it's just a sequence of abelian groups and homomorphisms. Right, let's say a n plus 1 to a n. Right, the um, the homomorphisms are <coughs> usually denoted by the boundary symbol um, with the property such that uh, delta squared is zero, right? Which is how we usually abbreviate that the composition of any two of these is zero. Okay. So anytime you have a, a chain complex, there's an associated homology. Um, so let's see. Uh, here's some more nomenclature. Elements of each of these would be called, um, well, let's say, okay, would be called K chains. Elements of the kernel of delta K would be called K cycles. Elements of the image of delta k plus 1 would be k boundaries. And then the homology of this complex, let's say hk, is the quotient of these, kernel divided by the image. This is called the kth homology group of the complex. And we're going to say the two cycles are homologous, right? Because we don't have enough words starting in hum in this class, uh, if, uh, if their difference is a boundary. Right, so two K cycles are homologous if they define the same element in the homology group. Okay. And then we worked out some examples. And that's what we did last time. So a bit longer of a review because we have so many new vocabulary words. Yes? Uh, so when we say two cycles are homologous, what do we mean by cycles here? Cycles are elements of the kernel of the boundary map. Ah, cycles. Yes. yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes? We talked last time about what an n chain looked like, and I was looking back over and I'm confused. We said something okay. about finite formal sum. Yes. So we're taking the free abelian group. Yeah. Right? So if you like, you can think about this as, as being you know, a module over the integers. Right? So it's like you have a vector space, but your, your field of scalars is not a field, it's the integers. And you're just taking these as your basis elements. 
right? So an arbitrary element looks like an, a linear combination with z coefficients of, of your, your generating set. And, um, and then we're defining the boundary. I'm just telling you what to do on the generators, and you just ex extend it linearly over the integers. Uh, yes. Um, so, um, so a simple uh, example was um, when we had, um, well, so we should go back over the examples we wrote out last time so that I can point to things and say these are homologous. So maybe let's do that after class if you like, because I won't actually be writing down examples today. Yes? So does all this require uh, yes, we, we need oriented um, simplices because we want this, um, this boundary map, right, um, to, um, you know, you, ha you have to know how to, what signs to put, right? And that, so the signs come from the orientation. Okay. So locally we need an orientation or we need an orientation of the entire segment? Well, really what's going on is the delta complex structure is with oriented simplices, right? So we don't need the space to be orientable. Or to, ha or to be oriented if it is orientable. We just need to be working with oriented um, delta complex structures. Yeah, so if you like, the orientation is cooked into this definition, and then you, it doesn't matter what space you apply it to. In particular, last time we talked about RP2 and the Klein bottle, and those are not orientable. More questions? Yes? Yeah, so it, because it's a free abelian group, we're, we're talking about um, linear combinations over the, the integers. So it makes good sense to subtract two of these, okay. right? So of course, you can't subtract them as maps from delta n to x, because there's no subtraction in x. But you can subtract them in the free abelian group, because element just looks like a bunch of these guys with integer coefficients. So just put 1 minus 1, right? And you've subtracted them. So. Um, and then the boundary map is defined um, by, by extending linearly. So it makes sense to apply it to the difference of two things. It's just the boundary of one minus the, difference, minus the boundary of the other one, viewed as elements of the free abelian group of k minus one chains. And so then it makes sense to ask if you have, uh, well, you don't need, so you take the difference and then you ask if that's in the image of the boundary. Right? And that tells you whether or not they're homologous. Okay. More questions? OK. Great, so the next thing we want to do is uh, think about um, how much does this depend on the actual delta complex structure you put on x as opposed to just depending on x itself, right? So the way we're going to address that is by um, taking an arbitrary space x, not assuming that it has a delta complex structure, and we're going to uh, define a homology theory for that space. And then eventually we'll show that these two homology theories are the same when you do have a delta complex structure. Um, okay, so... The way we're going to do that is instead of assuming that you have these nice maps from um, the standard simplices into x that satisfy all of these uh, conditions and you know reconstruct the space and everything, we're just going to consider all maps from the standard uh, n simple x into your space x. Okay, so this is called singular homology. Uh, singular. <clears throat> so X is going to be any topological space. So a singular N simplex is just a map from delta n to x. 
So what's singular about it is that, well, I'm not assuming anything about, you know, say, this restricts to the, the interior to be a one-to-one -one map. I'm putting no restrictions on this, this simplex. It could be collapsing the whole thing to a point, for example. Uh, or it could be uh, in coming back on itself. Right? So it's singular because I'm not uh, making it regular. So here we're going to define uh, Cn of x to be free abelian group on all of these singular n simplices. Right, so notice, for example, um, last time when we were talking about the torus and the Klein bottle and RP2 and we had explicit delta complex structures, we had um, finitely many simplices, right? We just had two, two simplices in each case, for example. Uh, in this case, you're going to have um, very, very large sets here, right? So, um, for example, for... Um, zero simplices, which are just pick out points in x, here you're going to have all points in x. Right? Each point is going to be its own generator. Okay, but we still have a boundary map uh, defined in the same way. To, to every singular uh, simplex, you're going to just take the alternating sum of the restrictions to the faces, right? So the boundary map we define the same way, and because it was just algebra, it still squares to zero. So, since this squares to zero, um, we get a complex. No, let's put x. This is a complex, a chain complex. So we can talk about the homology. Right, so this is going to be the singular. So we're just going to put singular in front of everything. This is the singular homology of x. These are the singular n cycles. These are the singular. and boundaries. Okay. So, the only case, basically, where you're not going to get something absolutely huge here is if you're just working with a single point. So let's compute it for a single point. is a point. Okay. There is a single singular n simplex for every n. Right? There's only one way of mapping the standard n simplex to a point. Right? Just map everything to that point. Okay, so what's the boundary? The boundary of sigma n is going to be minus 1 to the i sigma n restricted to the face where you've removed the i. Okay, but from every face, there's again a single map to a point, 
right? If you're looking at the standard n minus 1 simplex, there's only one map from that to the point. So each of these is the exact same element, right? If I sigma n, each of these is equal to sigma n minus 1, because there's only one map from the delta n minus 1 to a point. So this is equal to the sum i goes from 0 to n of minus 1 to the i, all of that times sigma n minus 1. Right? And this is equal to, um, well, so it starts at um, 1, and then it would be 1 minus 1, so 0, and then 1 minus 1 plus 1, so 1 again. So we're basically going to get 1, well, let's say sigma n minus 1, if uh, n is even. And we're going to get 0 if n is odd. OK, so that means our complex, right, which is c, uh, c n plus 1 of um, um, x, so let's say of a point, c n of a point, c. Uh, let's just, let's make it even. So I say 2n, 2n plus 1, 2n minus 1. C2, C1. Well, let's go with C1, C0, 0. OK, so each of these is a single copy of said, because there's a single generator. Right, it's free to group on a single generator, so it's just said. And the map. Well, if you start on a, um, an odd um, index, you get 0. If, um, OK, if I have an even one, it's going to take the generator of a Cn to the generator of Cn minus 1. Right? So that's just the identity map. Then this one will be 0. Right? This one started at 2, so it would be identity, and then this one will be 0. OK. So the boundary map alternates between being 0 and the identity. And uh, let's see, the h n, well, let's say k of the point identities and the zeros. Yeah, so it comes from here, right? So the boundary map is just identically zero if n is odd, right? So okay. if I take the boundary starting from an odd place, mm -hmm. it's just a zero map, okay. right? On the other hand, it takes sigma n to sigma n minus 1 if n is even, right? But each of these is just the free abelian group on sigma n, right? Because there's no other map from delta n to a point, right? So this said is just, you know, k times sigma 2n plus 1, and this is just k times sigma 2n, where k runs over all of the integers. And, uh, you know, k times sigma 2n minus 1. And the boundary map just takes, the boundary map just takes k times sigma 2n and gives you k times sigma 2n minus 1. Wait, why is that? Because, uh, because it's linear over the integers, and this is what it does to the generator. So the k just pulls out, and then on sigma 2n, I get sigma 2n minus 1. Right? Right? So, so in terms of the coefficients, it's just taking k to k. So it's the identity map. OK. So OK, so let's stare at this. Okay, sorry, I have one more question. Sure. So here, wouldn't delta 0 also be 0? Delta 0 is also 0, yes. But didn't we say it was sigma n minus 1? Uh, sure, this would be for n greater than 0. Yes, thank you. So yes, uh, sigma 0, because this is the 0 group. There's, there's only one map, yeah. 0, yeah. Um, OK, great. So, so let's stare at this. 
let's say that we are, let's position ourselves here, right? So I'm going to look at the kernel of this map. Right, well, the kernel of the identity map is just zero, right? So the guy on top is zero. I don't really care what the guy on the bottom is, but it's the image of the zero map, so it's also zero. So this group would just be zero, right? So if we're here, the group is just zero. What about if we're here? Well, in this case, uh, the kernel of the zero map is everything, right? So up here, I would get the integers. And then I have to mod out by the image of the identity map, but that's everything, right? So I would just get the integers over the integers, and I get to zero, right? So I get zero everywhere except here, because here we have zero on both sides, right? So the, I have z, the kernel of the zero map is just zero. Uh, sorry, the kernel of the zero map is everything, said, and the image of the zero map is just zero. So I get set over zero, so I get set. So this is equal to said if k is equal to 0 and 0 else. OK, so just for contrast, uh, for x a point, well, there's an obvious delta complex structure on x, where you just have one zero cycle and nothing else. So we would have delta n plus 1, say delta n, but here all of these groups would be 0 until you get to this one, which would be Z, right? Because you don't have any one, uh, uh, any one, any maps from the one simplex into the point in your delta complex structure, right? So we would again conclude that you get Z if K is equal to zero and zero else, right? That's right, yes, no coincidence. Okay. But notice the two extremes that for singular homology, these chain groups were as large as they could be. Whereas for um, the delta complex structure, the uh, uh, chain groups were as, as efficient as they could be, right? We only had the set where we needed it. OK. Uh, so to continue contrasting, um, So if x has a delta complex structure with finitely many cells, all of dimension less than or equal to n, then clearly uh, hk delta of x is finitely generated. and vanishes for k greater than n, right? Just because the groups in our chain complex vanish if k is greater than n, right? So that's easy to see uh, if you're doing uh, the homology associated to a delta complex structure. Uh, on the other hand, it is easy to see that the, um, the singular homology is, for example, uh, invariant under homeomorphism. So we'll get to this soon. 
right? So it's easy to see that if you have homeomorphisms, then um, the single homology is not going to change, right? Whereas uh, over here, if you have a map between two spaces, to, to get a map on, um, on the homology associated to a delta complex structure, I need both spaces to have delta complex structures, and I need the map to play well with those structures, right? So it's a lot more complicated. Whereas here, I don't need anything, right? For the singular homology, we will see soon, it's very easy to get a map between um, the homology groups. And it's very easy to see that homeomorphisms won't change anything. OK? Uh, so here's another easy property for singular homology. Yeah, so generally speaking, singular homology is wonderful when you want to prove things. And um, the homology associated to delta complex structure is wonderful when you want to compute things. So let's say you have um, the path components of your space. OK, then it's easy to see that the singular homology breaks up into the singular homology of the uh, path components, so direct sum. Not a direct product. And the proof is easy because since um, delta n is connected, the um, its image has to land in a single one of these path components, right? So the the chain groups themselves split into the chain groups of the individual path components. And the boundary map preserves this splitting. Can you say that one more time? Sure. So uh, an element here looks like a map from delta n to x. Right, but since delta n is connected, this image lies inside one of these. Right? And so, so even though you have a map into x, you actually have a map into x alpha for some alpha. Okay. Right? And so, so you actually get a, a splitting of the chain group itself. And the boundary map, well, if this mapped into x alpha, then its boundary also maps is, is made up of a linear combination of faces, all of which map into x alpha. So I actually get uh, a splitting. You could even write this like this. So the complex splits into a direct sum of complexes. Right. So the homology has to as well. Okay, only slightly more difficult x let's say that x is path connected then the zero homology group is the integers. So together with this proposition, that gives us the, uh, the statement we had when we first introduced homology, that the zero homology group, in this case the zero singular homology group, is always going to be just a direct sum over the path components of, uh, of the integers. OK. Okay. 
So. Okay, so H0 of x is the kernel of D0 mod out by the image of D1. Right? But D0 is just um, the zero map, right? Because it goes from C0 to zero. Right? So this map is always to zero. Uh, so this is C0 mod out by the image of D1. So like we talked about initially, C0 is just maps into, uh, from the point into your space. And you're going to consider them equal when, um, when they're in the image of the boundary from um, the one simplex, right? Well, the one simplex is just a path. So you're going to have two points, and you're going to consider them equivalent if there's a path joining them. That, so you have the, the difference as the boundary of that path. Right, so it's very intuitive. Um, here's how we're going to prove it. Um, let epsilon be a map from C0 to Z. So somebody here looks like a, um, a linear combination, um, say K alpha uh, sigma alpha 0. So it's just a bunch of points with coefficients. And what we're going to do is uh, just take the sum of the coefficients. Right. Can you explain one more time what the intuition was? You said two points are equivalent if they're the path connecting them? Yeah. So that's the idea. So why is that? Because well, elements here are just points, right? They're maps, maps from the point to your space. And, uh, and then the image of the boundary, this is the boundary of paths, right? So I have um, elements of C1, that's just paths in the space, so maps from the interval into the space. And then the boundary just takes the, uh, the right endpoint minus the left endpoint, right? So, so you, you're going to have points in here, and you're going to declare them equal if there is some path okay. that goes from one to the other. Okay. So that's the intuition. We're going to prove it using this, which it's called the augmentation map. And can you say again what the augmentation map is doing? Yeah, so an element here is really a, um, a finite sum of elements in here. Well, of, of, uh, of maps from okay. the point with uh, said coefficients, right? So all we're doing is uh, just take the sum of the coefficients. And what does the superscript zero mean? Oh, that, that it's an element of C0, okay. so it's going from the zero simplex. Okay. Sure. OK, so um, I do this because we're going to show that the image of D1 is the kernel of epsilon. And that'll help us identify the quotient with the image. Right, so, um, so notice that if you have a one simplex and you take its boundary, uh, then this is just epsilon of um, sigma restricted to V1 minus sigma restricted to be 0, and that's just 1 minus 1, 0. Right. So it kills the boundary, right? And on the other hand, if we have something that's in the kernel, Then I want to show that this is a boundary, right? So that there's some linear combination of one simplices uh, so that the boundary map gives you this guy. OK, so here's what we're going to do. Um, pick a point to some base point 
in x and let tau alpha be a path from um, <coughs> the image zero alpha point uh, to x naught. Right? So I'm just going to take each of these points and connect them to my fixed base point x naught. by some path. Of course, a path is just a map from the interval into x, and the interval is the one simplex. So uh, I can think of each of these as being um, inside C1. So now just consider what is the boundary of the sum of k alpha t tau alpha. So the boundary map, by definition, is linear over the integers. And then here, I'm going to get um, sigma. Oh, I meant to do this the opposite way. Well, I'll just put a minus. It's OK. Uh, so uh, I'm going to get sigma alpha 0 of point minus uh, x naught. So I get the sum of the k alpha of the sigma alpha 0 minus the sum k alpha, or if you like, sigma, let's call it x naught 0. Let's write it like this. So let's let sigma x naught 0 just be the map from the 0 simplex to x naught. So we get this, right? But of course, the sum of the k alphas is 0 because it's in the kernel of the augmentation map. So this is 0, and we just got, well, we got the, the guy we started with. So the sum of k alphas sigma alpha 0 is in the image of d1. OK, so we've shown that the kernel of epsilon is equal to the image of d1. So then h0 is equal to C0 mod out by the kernel of epsilon. So that's just the image of epsilon. But epsilon is obviously surjective. So that's it. Uh, yeah, because I'm just taking the, the sum of the coefficients, right? So just pick any point and put whatever integer you want. Oh, so the minus sign shouldn't have been there because I should have taken this path to start at x naught and end at this point, right? But instead, I took it to start here and end there. And so when I took the boundary, I was going to get the wrong sign. Okay. And so I just put a, a minus sign there, right? Still, still gives me the, the same answer. So the reason the minus sign disappeared from the first line to the second line is that the path is going in the wrong order? Is it here I took the endpoints? You know, you should take the the uh, the final point minus yeah, okay. the the beginning point, okay. right? But yeah, I put the minus sign because my path started the wrong place. Okay, so the reason it's called the augmentation map is that you can augment the complex. So um, you can look at the 
uh, so I'll just say C and C n minus 1. So everything stays the same, then you get to C0, and then you augment, and then you put a 0. And this is still a complex with the boundary maps. It's still a complex. It's still a complex because we, we already saw that epsilon composed with delta 1 is equal to 0. So it's a complex. The homology of this complex is called the reduced homology. So reduced. Homology of, uh, I don't have a, uh, so it's still complex, let's denote it C with a tilde. Because the homology is denoted with a, a tilde. So notice that you, you don't change anything for any n greater than 0. Right? You only change what happens to the 0 homology group. So uh, hn of x is hn tilde of x if n is greater than 0. And otherwise, it's hn tilde of x plus a copy of z. So really, all we're doing is removing a copy of Z from H0. Right. There, what's the reason why we're doing it? Yeah, so the, the, the feature is that the reduced homology of a point is just 0 in all degrees. Right. So I don't know, maybe for aesthetic reasons, you want the point to have no homology. So you take reduced homology. But really, it's because there are, there are theorems where um, you have a uniform statement except for the zeroth group. And so if you work with reduced homology, then you get a uniform statement. Yes? So you only get to work with reduced homology in the space of satellite uh, No, actually. So this, this is a complex no matter, um, no matter what. Um, it's, it's just removing one copy of Z. So for example, if I had 57 path components, then the usual homology uh, would give me for the zeroth group Z to the 57, and the reduced homology would give me Z to the 56. I'm just removing one copy of Z from H0. Right, in terms of the reduced homology, this would be the statement. This is what we just proved. Oh. Right, that for H0, well, no, for a point, whatever. If X is path connected, then H0, so here, X path connected. This is what we just proved, H tilde of X is 0. OK, so anyway, this is really, it's just a convenient uh, modification for, for uniform statements of theorems and aesthetics. OK. Great, so for a given space, we now have this sequence of groups, sequence of abelian groups, right? So we want to, to, um, we want to see how this depends on the space, or if you like, we want to show that uh, what we have are functors. So uh, let's assume 
uh, what, let's assume we have a map between two spaces. Um, we want uh, maps in homology. Okay, so if we want to get a map in homology, well, homology is defined by using the, the chain complex. So the first thing you want, we'll get these uh, by first getting a map of chain complexes. Okay, so. <clears throat> so this will be the noted F lower sharp from the chain complex of X, singular chain complex of X, isn't it? Singular chain complex of Y. Isn't it? Okay, great. So we're going to uh, proceed like we did with the boundary map. I'll tell you what to do on generators, and then you just extend linearly over the integers. So a generator of the um, n, um, nth chain group for x is a singular, um, a singular n simplex. So it's just a map from the standard n simplex to x. And we have a map f from x to y. So you just compose them. And that'll be f sharp, lower sharp of sigma. So my f lower sharp of sigma uh, is just um, f composed with sigma. It's a map from delta n to y. So then uh, extend linearly to a map from uh, Cnx to Cny. Sometimes we might write this as f sharp and then put an n to say that um, we're looking at the one on n um, chains. But most often, we won't bother putting the n. OK. Now, of course, if you're going to get a map of chain complexes, then you should have maps between the abelian groups. They should be homomorphisms. Well, that's easy because we've extended linearly. Um, but they should also play well with the boundary map. Right? So uh, fortunately, it does. Uh, so let's. Uh, let's just, for the sake of this um, equation, to be clear, I'll put a boundary upper x to indicate that I'm taking the boundary on the left. So this is uh, just minus 1 sigma. So the point is that the, the boundary map, as we saw last time, is defined by doing something to the domain of the of the map, right? And so if you're going to compose, well, you're doing the same thing to the domain. So you're going to, it's going to be the same whether you compose before or after. Boundary y of 
right? So F sharp commutes with with the boundary map. Okay. Yes. Yes. So remember, in this class, all maps are continuous. Yeah. All spaces are topological. You're allowed to do anything you like, right? As long as it makes sense. So why does it make sense to extend this linearly? Well, so by definition of free abelian group, if you like. So, so remember uh, when we talked about free groups, uh, the point of the free group was that if you have um, uh, any, so you, you take the free product of some, some groups, it has the property that if you have any homomorphisms, involving those groups, then it, you get a homomorphism from the free group. So you have a similar definition of the free abelian product. Um, and so it just says, you know, it is the group where you can do this and things commute. Yeah. But you could also just think of it as you have a vector space over Z. And so I just need to tell you what to do to a basis and then extend it linearly and you have a linear map. Right? But here a linear map is a homomorphism of abelian groups. Okay, so of course that's what we mean by a chain map. So let's let's write that out as a definition. So given uh, chain complexes, so let's say you had A with its boundary maps and B with its boundary maps. A chain map. Um, is a sequence of maps, well, a sequence of group homomorphisms let's say H n A n to B n such that H right, so we typically leave off the indices anytime we can. So we just say H commutes with the boundary. And what we mean is that uh, H, um, H n boundary n B is equal to uh, boundary n A, so then H n minus 1. Right? But like with everything, if you can draw a diagram, then that's much clearer, right? So um, uh, i.e. maps such that a n minus 1, a n plus 1, a n minus 1, Right? So a chain complex is just a sequence of abelian groups and abelian homomorphisms, uh, group homomorphisms, such that um, boundary squares to zero. And so a chain map is just a map from such a line to another such line, so that all of the diagrams commute. Okay. So anytime you have a chain map, you get a map in homology. So um, from, from commuting with the boundary, we see that H sends cycles to cycles 
right? So this is just, remember, the kernel of delta. And H sends boundaries to boundaries, right? This is just the image of delta. Right. So if something's in the image of delta, and I hit it with h, I get something that's in the image of delta. Right. And if if I have something that uh, gets killed when I hit it with delta, then if I hit it with h and then hit it with delta, it also gets killed. Right. So it sends cycles to cycles and boundaries to boundaries. Hence. I have a map from um, the homology of A to the homology of B. All right. So this will either write uh, H lower star, just like we did for the fundamental group, or if we want to be more explicit, also written. HN of little h. Right. Where are your subscripts on your A and your delta there? These are just dots. Okay. So it's just the complex. Okay. So you take the homology of the complex. And that's like every time I've been writing this, it's been dots. It's been dots, exactly, yeah. Yeah, so you always, when you're talking about the whole complex, you either put a dot or you put a star, but then that can be confusing because you're also putting stars over here. So it's better to use dots for your complexes and stars for the induced map. But you can also write the induced map like this. So you're emphasizing that it's a, um, well, in the case of, uh, of maps between spaces, that we'll get a functor. Right? So maps get maps. Um, OK. So anytime you have a, a map of chain complexes, you get an induced map in homology. What we saw over here is that given a map between spaces, we get a map between their singular chain complexes. Right? Given this, we get from C star. Right? And hence, um, for every n, a map between the singular homology of x and the singular homology of y, uh, also denoted So if we want to emphasize the n, we might use this notation. Okay. So we have induced maps, and the induced maps are really simple. It's just function composition. And then you extend everything linearly. Right? But because it's, easy, it's function composition, it's uh, easy to see that uh, if you have a composition, then the induced map is the composition of the induced maps. And if you have the identity map from a space to itself, then you get the induced map is the identity map on the homology. Right. So the induced map of the identity is the identity. Well, because you're just composing with the identity, so you're not doing anything. Right. And the induced map of composition is the composition of the induced maps. That's just because you're doing compositions and composition of functions is associative. OK? So from there, it's obvious that uh, a homeomorphism uh, gives you the, um, an isomorphism in homology, right? Because you have an inverse map so that the composition is equal to the identity on the nose. Right, so let's write that. Can 
It does, but that is not obvious. Uh, so uh, note, if f is a homeomorphism with inverse g, then um, f, let's do this, hn f from hn x to h and y is a uh, isomorphism, it's a group isomorphism with inverse h and of g. Okay, so indeed, is, this is also true for homotopy equivalences. Yes? Almost always star. I'll only use the n when I want to emphasize that it's acting on the nth group. Okay. So um, it's true that if f is a homotopy equivalence then f star is a group isomorphism. Well, let's say h and f. It's a group isomorphism for every n. Um, OK, so our next goal is to prove this. So in fact, we'll show that if f and g are homotopic maps, then the induced maps in homology are the same. OK. OK. So um, OK, so let's say that you have um, capital F um, a homotopy equivalence. Well, it's a homotopy. It doesn't have to be an equivalence. This is going to be a homotopy between F and G. Right? But just take any homotopy for the moment. So if I give you. Um, a singular sim n simplex in X, then um, then you can take um, sigma times the identity uh, from delta n cross i to x cross i. And you could compose this with F, capital F, to get a map from delta n cross i to y. So that's almost an n plus 1 uh, simplex in y, except, of course, that this is not the standard n plus 1 simplex. Right? So we should stare at this a bit. So for example, let's, so let's stare at um, if n is equal to 1, 
then uh, delta <coughs> 1 looks like um, uh, the interval, say, with vertices v0, v1. So uh, delta 1 times the interval is a square. And we're going to have vertices v0, v1, and then let's call these vertices w0, w1. Right. Well, maybe if these were v0, v1, I shouldn't be used. So let's call them instead a0, a1, and b0, b1. Right. So ai are going to be the vi with a 0, and bi are going to be the vi with a 1. Right. So for every vertex here, I'm going to get two vertices over here. And I'd really like to have two simplices. Um, so I can take the square and divide it in half like that, say. And then I have, uh, this is a two simplex over here, and this is a two simplex over here. Uh, similarly, Well, let me just write down what two simplices those are, and then I'll do the same thing. Um, so delta 1 is the union of two, two simplices. Um, A0, B0, B1, um, right, which we could call, say, alpha 0, and alpha 1, which is a0, a1, b1. Right, so this would be alpha 0, and this one is alpha 1. Okay. Um, in general, delta n cross i is the union of m plus 1 simplices of the m plus 1 simplices, say alpha i, it's going to be a0, a1, until you get to ai, and then you repeat the i index, but move on to the b's. Right, where Again, the AIs are just going to be VIs comma 0, and the BIs are going to be the VIs comma 1. So let me draw the case n equals 2. OK, so here I'm going to have a triangle and it's going to become a prism, right? So here I would have a0, a1, and then a2 is here in the back, and then b0, b1, b2. Okay, and I want to split this up into three simplices, so pyramids. The first one, alpha0, is going to be have vertices a0, b0, b1, b2, right? So I have to join all of these with a0. So I'm going to put a line there and a line there. And so you can see a pyramid here, right? That's alpha 0, right? So alpha 0 has this as the, the, say, the top of the pyramid and has this as the base of the pyramid, right? So you just join that. Then the next one, alpha 1, so alpha 0 here was a0, b0, b1, b2. Alpha 1 is going to be a0, a1, b1, b2. Right? So a0, a1, b1, b2. So now this is going to be the top of the pyramid, and here is our base. So I just have to join this one there. Okay. So that's alpha 1. And then alpha 2, a0, a1, a2, b2. Uh, so this one, I don't have to draw any more lines. 
the, um, the base of the pyramid, if you like, would be A0, A1, A2, so the bottom triangle. And then B2 up here is going to be the top of the pyramid. Right, so let's say alpha 2 is down there, going up. OK? And um, what you get is that this is the, the union of these alpha i's. So it's easy to see that it's the union. In fact, um, the, um, uh, if you look at the, the interiors, then um, there's no overlap between them. Uh, so um, I'll let you read that in the book, because I don't have time to, to do it in class today. Uh, or we can talk about it later. But um, this does give us a decomposition of um, delta n cross i as a bunch of uh, n plus 1 simplices. So, so we're going to get a map, which we call the prism map, because these look like prisms. So define p from cnx to cn plus 1 y. Right? So we're going to take an n simplex on x, and we're going to get back an n plus 1 simplex on y, right? Because we're going to take this and split it up into n plus 1 simplices. So p of sigma is minus 1 to the i of this f um, composed with sigma uh, times identity restricted to alpha i, right, which we could write, we, we could write out as this restricted to, and then alpha i is just do the a's until you get the ai, and then start with the b's, repeating the ith index. OK? So we have a map from delta n times the interval to y. And we're just taking, say, each of these divisions. We're restricting it to each one and putting an appropriate sign. OK, so great. We have a map, and it takes chains to chains. So we just need to worry about what it does to boundaries. OK, <clears throat> so boundary well, similar to when we were looking at the um, oh, let me give myself more room some j less than or equal to i minus one f plus same cross i. So as we've done before, we want to separate on whether you've gotten to the ith term or not, because the, the sign is a little different in either case. Um, OK, well, let's pick it up next time. We'll show that this is equal to um, um, minus p of boundary sigma plus um, F sharp minus a G sharp. But let's do that computation next time. <clears throat>